opening post message. I'm happy to go next since you mentioned my organization. So thank you. Um, uh, thank you all for being here, both virtually and in person. My name is Michelle Magner, and I am the Deputy Regional Director for the Anti Defamation League or ADL. Um, if you're unfamiliar with ADL, we are in over 100 years in by the organization with the mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. We do this in a variety of ways. Um, we work to advocate, um, investigate, and educate. Um, so advocate for communities, uh, the Jewish community and other marginalized communities. Uh, investigate, we work um, with law enforcement. We have a center on extremism um, that tracks extremism across the country. Um, and then we educate, we work with schools um, to do anti-bias education as well as anti-Semitism and Holocaust education. Um, I think, you know, for tonight, what I wanted to come here and talk about was, um, unfortunately, we know that anti-Semitism continues to be on the rise, um, you know, certainly within our region, but also nationally. Um, ADL does an audit of anti-Semitic incidents every year um, since uh, 1979. Um, and this year, in 2022, was the worst year for anti-Semitic incidents uh, since ADL began practice this four decades ago. Um, we had 3,697 incidents reported across the United States in 2022, which was an increase of 36% in 2021. Um, unfortunately, um, as I said, you know, this uh, data sort of confirms um, what anecdotally the community has been reporting, which is, you know, continued rise of anti-Semitic attitudes, beliefs, things like that. Um, in terms of Virginia, uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we saw a 50% increase um, from 2022 to 2021. Um, there were uh, uh, 49 incidents in 2020, so that's also a 41% increase um, from 2020. Um, there were 69 full incidents reported in Virginia in 2022. Um, Virginia also registered as the 13th highest in the country um, for anti-Semitic incidents in 2022. Um, in regards to sort of the categories um, that we have in the audit, um, that includes harassment, vandalism, and assault. Um, in terms of harassment, we had 50 incidents reported, um, which is a 43% increase, uh, 19 incidents of vandalism, um, which was a 73% increase. Um, and fortunately, we've had zero reports of assault um, over the last five years. Uh, in Fairfax County, um, specifically, in 2022, there were 17 incidents reported to ADL. Um, that's up from 14 the previous year in 2021. In regards to sort of what we are seeing in Fairfax County, um, white supremacist propaganda firing um, that sort of tracks because Virginia, unfortunately, um, had a significant amount of white supremacist uh, propaganda in 2022. In fact, ranked as number three in the country. Um, for white supremacist propaganda distribution. Um, so we saw uh, white supremacists flying, as I mentioned, um, 12 incidences of verbal or written harassment, um, two incidents of, of vandalism, um, and one incident of a bomb threat. Um, so as I said, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing you know, continued rises of anti-Semitism, not just you know, within our sort of community, but across the country. And obviously that has impacts right, um, at every possible level. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, there were some, some comments about increased incidents of hate sort of across the region, um, in the D.C. region, and absolutely um, have unfortunately seen um, increased incidents sort of across uh, the D.C. area. Um, in Maryland, um, D.C. actually had a, a lower a decrease in incidents reported, um, but we're still, you know, hearing from community members um, of, about incidents of, of anti semitism So I think I can stop with that. And someone else on the panel? Um, sure. Um, I just also would say that just as we're seeing um, incidences in the community, uh, we've seen incidents with the students as well. Um, take it very, very seriously. And I think my message is very clear that um, no matter what race, what color, what national origin, what religion, we want every student with staff to be very welcome and interested and, and to let them do the death of um, To have um, um, policies in place and regulations, and we have um, a non discrimination policy 
and very clear in our um, discipline and both our student rights and responsibilities. We were just going over that SR and how we call it. Um, is being different here, and we are being much more explicit in that for the upcoming version, and including specific examples of hate crimes, and hate speech, and um, what it, what it is that it will not be tolerated, and what the consequences are when one of these incidents occur. We uh, want to address it right away. I am going to. Um, investigate first of all and then we also want we're trying to be as transparent as possible in sharing what has happened and also a restorative aspect um, to it as well wherever we can um some of the incidents have been harassment and vandalism and again we want to address it um we're having many community um meetings on this. In fact, our superintendent who was invited to be here to see me is at a, um, a Jewish synagogue um, in the community conversation. I believe the cells and board members um, put on by the um, JC um, person. Uh, um, very much so are also about um, wanting to educate students. So we have an equity department and an equity cultural response team that provides training both to staff as well as students and, um, and making sure that um, uh, and they understand and promote anti-hate and anti-bias. Uh, I think, you know, from my level, I would say that it's a combination of a lot of our racial and you know, kind of jumps go to so I think that there's a lot of a lot of effort made by the police department to be proactively in the community to make time to get all the issues before they start. We see the headlines like all of you do that are referring to Montgomery or Fixed Gorges or wherever throughout the region. And uh, we want to make sure that we're trying to keep those on the low in Fairfax County uh, and not by chance. So, with the police department's ability down there at the station level or the engagement with the community, but I think that the other aspect is the, the focus that the board has had on, uh, on equity and community engagement, where they look at the kind of wide vision to plan, the one Fairfax policy. You know, I think that everything starts at the community level and we're looking for communities that are better engaged and inclusive and, and build uh, neighborhoods and, and you know, partnerships with each other. And, and that ends up through, and through county government throughout all levels, so whether it's uh, outreach by county agencies to engage with communities, whether Makes it to the police department either for proactively engaging with the community or when a crime does occur that they investigate it appropriately and, and if there's a charge that needs to be handled that is up to the commonwealth attorney to make a determination and appropriately charge uh for anyone that makes those uh commits violation uh, and i think that it's that that long stem of uh continuous process working with the school that we're able to collectively work and solve this issue i don't think any one agency or any one community can do it on their own, except by the effort. And you can see over the last couple of years, there's been several board matters and items by the post supervisors who have continually brought forth matters to make sure that we are doing things at an agency level or community level to engage and address these issues before they become something systemic. I think we see uh, issues that occur, but we don't see uh, they can talk at racial men's to it, whether it's whether it's five times the big runs or, or police district commanders and seeing Sully out here uh, uh, the more engaged with uh, district commanders when they find pocket provisions, whether it's from vandalism in cars, whether it's uh shoplifting at one of your retail stores or bias crime, the commanders are those that those people that are most connected with the community and can avoid having to get up to my level of uh, police chief, fire chief, or any other agency that we work with, and they can take care of it before it gets there. I think even to the numbers that you spoke of, if you look at the numbers in Virginia, having drastically increased from 2021 to 2023, Fairfax County did not go up as high as what the state or the board of the nation. So uh, I wouldn't say that it's luck. I think that it's a, a cumulative effort that's a culmination of the public and private uh, the, the county government and nonprofit agencies out there that collectively made us a very safe place uh, in welcoming the environment. Sure.
I can just add a couple of examples of things that we've seen specifically here in Fairfax County, just to give you some perspective. Um, so uh, year to day, we've had 11 bias crimes reported to us. Uh, and so again, example would be, uh, we had a case involving an individual that made some unprovoked, uh, racially disparaging or derogatory remarks, uh, towards another individual. Um, and then he proceeded to take, uh, some drink bottles and threw them at the, at the victim assaulting him. So that was 1 particular case, um, that, uh, was investigated. Um, another uh, incident that we uh, investigated started as a verbal uh, altercation between two neighbors. It escalated uh, again, racially disparaging marks were made, and then uh, the victim in that case was threatened with a knife. So again, these are cases that we actively investigated. Uh, we placed charges as necessary. Uh, again, working through um, with the, our detectives and uh, the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Um, and then an example of a bias incident on the flip side would be, uh, I know that hate literature specifically was mentioned earlier. So, uh, if somebody was distributing unsolicited hate literature or hate was, uh, using hateful speech or slurs, uh, name calling, uh, or other, any disrespectful or derogatory actions absent of any crime, that's what we, that's what we, uh, classify as those bias incidents. And so we've had a few cases of that as well. Uh, around the county that, and again, like I said, we, we very proactively track these and, uh, again, as, as a station commander, when these things happen, uh, we do everything we can to address those with the community. Um, our goal is obviously that we want to make sure our community uh, feels safe and secure and whether it's their homes or their businesses or their places of worship. Um, and then, you know, again, just to touch on, uh, you know, the houses of worship. When we see something that, whether it happens in the United States. Uh, in California, or it happens in Montgomery County, or it happens uh, overseas uh, to whether it's a synagogue or a mosque, or again, any any facility, we proactively reach out to those community members, uh, you know, and we provide that reassurance, we provide extra patrols. Um, you know, I've had officers that will, you know, they go and they'll write their reports uh, in in a you know parking lots and. Just to be that visual presence, and so that can be very reassuring. So, but again, just some of the examples. I'm sure you probably have a couple more um, things that we've investigated. But yeah, so I would say I would describe our team's role as um, so we're going to get any bias crime and or bias incident. If the bias incident obviously does involve a crime, we're still going to get notification of it through our reporting process, and our patrol officers do a really good job, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but under our umbrella. These th those types of investigations for us are going to fall within our kind of our threat management, our threat assessment roles, which may or may not include a bias component to it. Um, I give one example of a bias incident that came to me specifically uh, within the past several years. It involved a white male subject driving in the neighborhood, somewhat randomly stops two white males pushing a stroller with a young female in it. He Ask big directions, uh, ask them for uh, questions about where to go, how to get there. And then he made uh, very disparaging and specific and vulgar remarks toward another race. And, you know, all, all these people involved were white. But we, that came to us through the, the individuals walking down the street, reported to the police, and came up to us. And then I have no crime, but obviously that's concerning behavior. We, we can all agree. And I'm, I'm providing this as an example of what we do right. And we kind of, in my opinion, go the extra mile to make sure, okay, that's concerning. We can all agree. Um, what can I do to figure out what this person is all about? What resources do I have? Even if a crime's, uh, I don't have a crime. There are some open source or some other ways for me to determine what might be going on. And in this case, particular case, this individual that was, uh, we were able to identify him. And red flag after red flag, looking into his background and some other things. Of course, a lot of times when we investigate these, there's a, a mental health concern with the subject in question. Um, but what we're trying to do is prevent targeted violence. And there are so many red flags in this particular incident that we uh, that I kept going. I wanted to try to mitigate the situation as, as best as I, as I could. And to this day, it's been over two years. I still somewhat, um, you know, as I legally can, uh, monitor this individual and. and Make sure he has resources and, and anything that I can do to mitigate any targeted violence from him. That 
you know, came from a concerning incident, a concerning conversation, and, and uh, you know, just kind of randomly out on the street. Of course, within that umbrella too, if 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 my team has a crime, most of the time we are going to place charges or seek criminal charges as you know within that mitigation effort. So I don't, I don't know if that kind of clears up what what our team does, and we have to take questions about that, but. I wanted to kind of give you a practical example of what we might do within a threat assessment role, a threat management role. And our relationship with Fairfax County Public Schools, uh, as most people probably know, we have an SRO in every middle school and high school. And so, again, these these incidents come up, and, and we do we'll take reports of them. Um, some some of the crimes are handled administratively. Uh, through the school, and that's through. Um, a, there's a process in place for that, um, and uh, and so we'll we still document all those cases. We we look into everything, uh, but uh, again, there, we've had a couple cases uh, that were able to be handled administratively in the school instead of going the criminal route. And, and as we know, as, like Detective Young said, some of these cases the uh, the involved individuals need uh, some other resources, whether it's you know, mental health and, and not not as much in the school system we don't see, but like, you know, just substance abuse and some of those kind of issues that have um, created um, issues for this, the person that we're dealing with. So. In which case, partnerships outside the police department becomes extremely valuable to properly mitigate something like that, in my opinion. We're very fortunate that we have yeah. lots of partners and resources in Fairfax County for just exactly that. Um, and we do work very closely with our SROs. They're really members of our staff and, and I'm, I'm members of our family. Um, I would also say we have different systems for tracking different um, disciplines. Concerns as such, but one thing that we are um, developing is an easier way for students and staff and families to report acts of discrimination. Um, and um, that's going to be uh, completed in the upcoming months, and it'll give us a better way to monitor the track. And we're asking folks to identify themselves so that we can respond to them. But if not, to even report it in And so um, this will make it much easier for school students and families to file complaints and for us to track specifically where they're. As part of the recent laws, there was an article in the last week's post. Yeah, some of the procedures used by the Lowell County school system that were invalidated by a court circuit court. And that was where people who felt threatened, not threatened, but thought that some conversations might have been borderline, reported into a concern, and it was tracked. And the court ruled that that was basically a violation of free speech. I don't know if you're familiar with that article. I saw it. And that just train. Does the county, Fairfax County, do something like that? Do we do, we do something similar to what Loudoun County is doing? No, we're we're developing, you know, a system or a way to for people to report and for us to respond consistently. Right now, we have bullying and harassment um, um, oh, system. That's what I'm about. system. But we're trying to be and pinpoint much more specifically about acts of hate. Well, rather than, I think the problem was that it was just somebody said, you know, a statement that he, he or she thought there was no such thing as white, that was a gold uh, privilege. And that was then reported up the chain of command that that person had said that. And that person now has a mark against him or her because he, he or she said that. And of course, and things like that should be tracked. Yeah. And I don't, we don't have a system such as that. Currently, I mean, haven't quite finished developing. We're still working on our, but our, our method. Our and are you going to then 
vetted with uh, some citizens groups like the I know there's the uh, BTAs and the Fairfax Federation has an education committee. Will you then take what you develop and bring it to some citizens groups with their input and comments? I believe we will be sharing and trying to get input. Um, um, we want everyone, we want to be as transparent as possible, and we want um, our systems for reporting to also. Um, uh, for folks to understand and not feel threatened by it. You know, all of the tools and things that we're putting into place are to help them to make sure that this is not happening. And we want to be proactive where we can. And the only way to be proactive is to know exactly what is going on you know, within our schools. We have many staff, our eyes and ears are wide open, but we don't always know and it's a community effort in which we need input from. Uh, Thank you very much. Does anybody have any comments or questions they'd like to address? If you do, just raise your hand. Hey, this is kind of a two part question. Uh, first, pretty nice work in the work back time and well as So, do you think that's been our benefit? Do you think that's not been your best when you said about the I think it's a benefit. I mean, I, I think that's part of what helps create that kind of exclusive community. Is that you know there are certainly pockets of of uh, I guess you look around the town. And there there are some communities that are are are, are not very close. Uh, you know, there's others that that are. I think that when you look at the population, one point one, you know, one point two, or something like. Uh, if you look around, we all see our neighbors. To your point, I mean, you said Sully, Murray, Burris, and think about it. You know, on the western edge of the county. You know, you look here versus Bailey, and, and those communities change over time. Like I was in the fire department before coming to this role, and think back to what Bailey's looked like in the 2000s. You know, it continued to evolve. And I believe that when you see it, when you don't have the diversity, yet, I think because the more diverse they are, uh, and people just having conversations and being able to learn about other calls and so forth, that's one of the driving factors of why well, we experience such a, a, a good environment in the local ones. Yes, yeah, it's, it's certainly a benefit, and I just wanted to add from the police department's perspective as well. Um, you know, my last command was in our hiring, uh, hiring police officers specifically, and um, you know, our goal is to uh, is to look like the community that we serve, and, and so we've made significant strides in, in those efforts um, for our hiring, and it just it creates uh, a. a a better understanding of cultures. And I think we're very fortunate to be in this area and, and live in this area uh, with so many uh, people of diverse backgrounds. And it does, it lends itself to better community engagement and understanding. I'm saying that we're fortunate. We're not, we're not like the veterans in society. The other part of it is, you know, that hate is not a inherent in our Something we love. And so when I'm kind of curious, we look for ABL, we look for other types of problems. We see where you get to a certain age, all of a sudden you start seeing more of it, more severe instances. And it is a I I my daughter took that kind of school rest and you're okay. okay with you know the many of her friends are not like not like us, but and so I, I'm wondering, do we know that there's a case where we start to see more of it? And like after grade school, after high school, after junior, you know, once they get up into the 20s and 30s, more instances of crime or just yes. Well, I can't speak to instances of crime, but um, we know that children uh, can develop negative attitudes towards different at a difference at a very early age, right? And we all pick up, um, you know, no one is without bias. It's, all have bias, bias is reversal. Um, and so, you know, from a very early age, young people can pick up cues from the environment, um, both explicit things and, and things that are not explicit, right? The books that we're reading at home, the shows that we're watching, the things that we hear on TV, what our community looks like. Um, and so I think it's really important to, you know, to the, the first question you have was about diversity, differences should be celebrated. Um, it's not enough just to talk about similarities. Um, it's great that there are things that make us the same, but if we only talk about similarities, 
similarities, that signals to young people. Those are the only things that are acceptable about people that are different than us. Um, so it's really important from an early age to show value and appreciation for difference, um, to celebrate differences. And so our young people can develop those positive um, feelings as well about folks that are different. It's normal, right? I have a two-year-old. She asks me questions all the time and sometimes makes me uncomfortable, right? She notices things about me. Bobby, what are you doing? Why are you wearing that, right? We need to uh, make sure we're responding to those questions and not shutting them down, right? Um, that way that we can enforce and ensure that we are celebrating diversity um, from a very early age to ensure we have that appreciation um, in our schools and our communities and businesses. As county employees as well, you know, we you know, because you recognize these implicit biases and stuff, and um, you know we do extensive training. Uh, and I know this is not just true of the police department, but in you know uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion training, and again implicit bias training. And it's you know we all have these implicit biases. It's just being able to recognize that everyone has them, and, and so we're uh, we're very focused on ensuring that our employees, uh, you know, are. Are trained in these and recognize this, these sort of things. I was going to say, if you remember the play South Pacific in the song, you have to be carefully taught. Maybe I'm dating myself in the song. It was the nurse who was singing about how she had prejudices against children of color. Yeah. French Island. There it is. Well, go ahead. If you. Oh, just a uh, very small, uh, just talking about, I mean, I grew up in the books and it was born in 1965, so I and it's not to say it's always been so much, it's been a phenomenon, there's some problems, but I don't really have to do this, and there's some more okay, difference, and it's a very strong, but it's, it's been a positive until recently, it's all about to say, but my friends, born in Haiti, now, Certain things are changing that and it's here. But we have those in the basic calendar, so we fight to keep it that The diversity is. I mean, my daughter is looking at colleges, she's my favorite, but my daughter's looking at colleges, and she was, I don't know, JMU, she was always these white girls. But the truth is, obviously, that wasn't, that wasn't true. She went to Mason. She went to Mason because she knows Mason to be here. And she went to Mason, and it is a huge universe. Like national, international, and just out of my mind. So to me, somebody who's grown up here, this is hugely important. We are very special. I just hope to say it, you know. So to celebrate that diversity in our schools. It's, yeah, it's much important. And there's things going on now. Like, I was like, what? Well, we learned this AP, we read all those books. And I saw them about being one. And she went, I'm in my, in my, I wanted to ask about, um, and I have the security officers in the school, board, school board. Um, I, I know you said you had the diversity of the, the officers themselves, but sometimes it's more than just having the same race, but getting to know the person so that the kids aren't afraid to go to the police if they have a problem. And less Robocop and more um, Andy Griffith. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, yet knowing, knowing your police officer your friend and somebody that you can go to if there's a problem and not being afraid, what would say? I could, I could give just many, many examples of where our SROs, you know, they are there and they are police officers, but they're there to help students. You know, they are to act in a proactive and supportive way. You know, if they need to respond in a different way, they will do everything they can to work closely, not only with students, but also with families. Um, if there's a problem or a challenge. And uh, I can speak as a former high school principal when I say our SROs were very intricately involved with our, our students in a very positive way, getting them help getting them resources, make sure that they understand that a poor decision, what that can do, and how they can help them to make other decisions. I'm very excited. Uh, 
but on, on the next door, they have the coffee with the top and, you know, friendly ice cream with the top or something. They have, they have these little friendly events for people to know who the, the officers are in their area, just a school map, something like that, to, to know who the officer is and, and I can't yeah, speak know them. specifically, but oftentimes our SROs will be with parents or PTA groups or will um, be out in the community to support our sporting events. And while they're out and, and looking and making on patrol, they are also very much so interacting with families, introducing students. And um, it's, it's an amazing um, resource that. Um, your parents very fortunate. So day, day to day, the SROs are involved in a variety of different tasks. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's just being present in the hallway uh, or, you know, at, you know, dismissal and, 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 um, and during, whether, whether it's during the, you know, the bell change or whatever, um, you know, they, a lot of them will go in and, um, you know, they'll teach as well. Um, and so they're, they're very well known in the schools. You know, the, the, the kids that, you know, are, you know, maybe getting in a little more trouble know them very well, but, uh, but the goal is that, you know, they are a resource for those students and, you know, the faculty and the families. Um, and so I, I know quite a few SROs that uh, go way above and beyond in their duties and, you know, they um, do tutoring after school and they, they're mentors to people and, you know, I've known officers that were SROs in their careers that, you know, to this to this day, they'll see a student who comes up and, and is just so grateful for the presence that they've had in their lives. So, you know, they uh, they do their best to, to, to be that positive influence. And, and we don't have SROs in our elementary schools, but, um, you know, for example, at Sully, I have a community outreach officer. And so she does a lot with the schools as well. Um, and so we're, we, we'd like to go in and do programs. Uh, some of the other districts, uh, you know, they'll do um, uh, go in at lunchtime, they'll go in and, and read, read stories and, and volunteer in different ways. Uh, so we're still trying to get that engagement at that, you know, early level. And, you know, we want, uh, we want them to know, don't be afraid of us. We are we're here to help you. We're here as a resource. We can be mentors. Um, you know, we have a job to do. Uh, certainly at times, but, uh, but, but it's more than that. Go ahead. So I have a couple of questions if I could. So I'll answer yes, our question. I um, just was told starting with my daughter was a student at Stone Hill School. And she got to know the SRO player. And, and, and so in a lot of occasions, maybe it wasn't for a good reason. Um, a lot of miles, right? But they came to know the SRO really well. And actually got a few of the kids that I my daughter was hanging around to this department to meet the officers and take a little walk and a little tour of the, of the area and back to you know what I mean. So it was wonderful. That's why I like the SROs. So I also asked a question. Um, I know the bullying is a big topic. It has been long. Is there, is there a relationship in this bullying with the crime that being biased and incidents and things like that? Or do you think? I don't know about the, of the relationship, but in the sense that you know, bullying can occur from many things. And it could be, you know, again, it could be because of a race or cultural you know, um, difference or religion. Um, and, and so do um, you take matters very seriously? You know, when those occur, um, we try. We definitely will investigate. It's it's sometimes hard because bullies are hard to catch, and you know not everyone wants to tell. But we do due diligence in trying to make sure we identify, you know, uh, provide uh, consequences, um, but also work on the restored aspect of it wherever we can. So, like, if there's an incident in school, you have to get reported and that's the yes. confidential. Pardon. Confidential in a sense, there. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's not little little Billy is the thing about big Billy and you know what I mean and names and stuff. Or is it kind of confidential in a sense? What's not going to get worse? 
So that would be like for instance. Yeah, for us. So we I'll give you an example of a case. Yeah. So we we were involved uh, with a student um, that had a history of bullying behavior against another student. Uh, and things uh, did escalate and racially disparaging remarks were then made. Um, and then that uh, one student threatened another student. So, um, you know, there, so that was something that we got involved in uh, with the schools because it was more than just bullying. It, it, it went above because, again, the, the racially disparate remarks and then the, the threats to assault. And, and then there were some other issues uh, in that case as well. So that's something that, again, that uh, was reported to us uh, and, and we investigated. So. Well, I was just going to say also that. He had mentioned earlier it's really diverse. I mean, just having a panel of everybody here in front, I think we one of the big, really diverse stuff here. Um, but um, if there was something that you were missing in any of your requirements that you would like to see, like the wishes, it's Christmas time or something like that, right? Because what would you say was this missing in the sense that we try to stay ahead of us, try to keep it in the rear of the year that the other, we you know, our county, right, versus Fairfax. I don't know, sorry, wish list. Yeah, from the police department side, obviously staffing is is a concern for us, and actually probably with the schools as well. Um, you know, we uh, you know, working uh, very hard to increase our staff. We have the largest academy class uh, in the last ten years or so. Started I started uh, I think one day uh, with fifty six uh, recruits. So you know, staffing is a challenge for us, and uh, you know, having having officers to to go out. And not just be reactive and respond to calls, but to be those, those proactive officers and, and go out there and, and make those positive impacts in the community. So that's step is certainly a challenge that we're, we're working on. It's not the fact that you don't have the positions, you don't have the people to fill the position. Is that what you're saying? If we're short uh, on officers and, and like said, we're doing everything we can to uh, correct that uh, okay. as opposed to we need 10 more slots. No, okay, just not that we won't take them. But. Understand, yeah. understand, but there's a difference in category. And yeah. I just want to understand that. All right, thank you. I appreciate the clarification. I don't, I'm not, I can't speak from uh, the investigators that as a station commander. I think from the school side, staffing as well. Um, I think that whenever we can use our um, folks for mental health supports. Um, you know, we can certainly do more and um, increasing our SROs um, and within our new budget for this upcoming year. Uh, we are um, hiring, I think it's five um, uh, SRO positions, security positions, and they will be responsible for the region, specifically for helping the elementary. And um, so we're, we're excited about that. And um, um, just also, we have an office of um, equity and, and um, cultural responsiveness. They're doing a lot of training, both of staff and, and working with our students. And we could increase those from the as well. Last question, you mentioned something about community array. Who would be seven of those in here for the So we have. Um... Uh, a distribution list of all of our uh, leaders in the faith community, uh, and they're all invited to uh, these meetings. It's uh, my uh, community outreach officer uh, and my crime prevention officer are the ones who, who set these meetings up. Uh, and uh, so we're giving me quarterly. So. so we we it's uh, mostly a conversation with our faith leaders. Uh, not to say that we couldn't uh, have. Uh, additional conversation for me in one book. Yeah, I think it's I think it's great to do this. Unfortunately, society they keep the wrong with each other. Yeah, I know. And religions, you know, it's tough to speak to begin. Yeah, we're we're pretty fortunate here in the Salt Lake District that uh, you know our our faith leaders uh, work together and uh, they respect each other and, and so and that's we've seen that uh, as evident in, in these meetings. So. In the schools, the girls, I, I'm hearing that girls are, are afraid to go back to the old day um, for, for different reasons, but 
Um, not feeling safe to use the bathroom, but but it's your policy. Well, we are monitoring very closely. I think we have an all hands on deck um, with um, um, making sure that we are in and out and all in the hallways and in our bathrooms as well. Can't rely on one SRO and one of our team security staff. It's really all of us that have to do so. We're also working with our students, talking with our students, going over their expectations um, and consequences, asking that you know, when you see something, that you say something, you know, right away, um, so that we can collect the all work together. Are you hearing in sense somebody not saying something or not telling well, I'm concerned that parents aren't being informed. Well, I think working with youth, particularly, you know, middle school, high school, they don't always tell a parent. We encourage them to. We ask that they find an adult, they share with an adult they, that they feel comfortable with. Um, we ask that if um, students hear something or something that they share, more so, so that we can help and so that we can be a resource. Um, to teachers that talk to parents. The teachers, parents, and students all need to talk. Yeah. yeah, we all, this is a community effort and it's going to take all of us working together. And so, definitely, we are trying to do more and more. How should they use singles, backwards, and and that, I mean, that's for LGBTQ, you know, I understand that, but it also gives a place where you can't see what's going on at the same time. Those are, those are two completely different issues at the same time, and then spending all this time in building the bathroom, and then something can happen behind the store. I mean, we're monitoring as closely as we can. So would that be two people going to see so there's that that's what I was worried about. I mean that you could have have a small uh, place, you know, they just decided not to go to the second location, it's a second location with that. Well, it's a little space. So only one person, probably one person should be in the bathroom at one time. Yeah, I think that can happen anywhere to anyone, anytime. Sure. Like at Target or Sam. You know, or multiple. Bathrooms, uh, anyone who taps in that, and they like, move it. It's in trouble. You shouldn't be exactly. looking, touching, you know, anything. And only it doesn't happen. If it does, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Anybody have? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two. Kind of related questions, maybe getting a little bit deeper into the weeds. So, okay, I'll just pull it out of the whole numbers of panel for appreciation of public comings tonight. Uh, I agree it's very important to kind of track, you know, year in year number of incidents that are reported and such. But have you gone one step further and just tracking the number change from year to year, saying what's the rate of those incidents compared, say, to number of 100,000 population? Well, the community keeps growing. So even if you have an increase from, say, American 10 to 12 incidents, population was never more, the actual rate of decrease. Well, again, question one. Question two is, uh, have you looked at doing any comparisons to how things are progressing in the surrounding jurisdictions, whether it's Loud and Prince William, uh, Arlington, Alexandria? So, how are their numbers changing year to year, and how are their rates of reported incidents, perhaps whatever pattern is changing? I think that our rates, that our population, that doesn't change that much. You know, 1.1 million people that have anything statistically significant. That's a much bigger jump. I think last year the population was down 10,000. Uh, and so your 1.1 to you know, 1.099, um, we're talking about 120 to 150 incidents, probably rates that actually are that we're about, I think, the data rate that. Uh, yeah, last year, um, 
I mean, just look at last year, 2022, uh, what we reported, there was 151 incidents, either bias crimes or bias incidents in the county. So, and that's not just in somebody, but the county the county county yeah. county. Yeah. So I think if you look at the, the two, you know, there, there's uh, these two would the office look to make sure that we're looking at the, the data, the percentages versus just numbers. I think it'd be very misleading. If you brought up the point like 14 to 17 is a big jump by percentage versus you say three. But from the regional perspective, um, you know, Fairfax County part of TAW, that's called Washington County of Government. Within that, there are lots of subgroups. One of those being uh, the Homeland Security Advisory Committee, and that's where uh, the, all of the law enforcement agencies, federal partners, as well as local jurisdictions, and uh, they routinely need to share information, whether it be on auto thefts, uh, install catalytic converter, uh, bias crimes, those all come up. So the agencies are, are sharing information. And certainly, when you cross the river sometimes with good data and numbers, you can maybe get more information on the Virginia side a little more easily than what we can with Maryland. But I mean, that, I think that the, the data sharing and the discussion points on what we're seeing at a regional level from jurisdictions. Uh, happens on a, you know, on, a, on a monthly basis at the Canada's Hall level, but certainly the chiefs, the law enforcement agencies are, are talking on a much more frequent basis. So, to your, to your second part, I think yeah, that, that information would be looked at, be looked at from the perspective of, of percentage by population, not just about you know, yeah, total. Any other questions? I hear it when you're done this time. And I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, the uh, Commonwealth Security was on the site, web, on, on the uh, web account. Then I got a message that he was called for an emergency meeting. Someone was had a job off. So I did see Steve and his name log on, and then something happened where they signed him. We'll find out tomorrow the paper like that. But in any case, they didn't call me from so it must have been a bigger system. But let's say a bit different change to come in. The yeah. other question I was going to have is you talk about SROs. I assume the SROs report to each police station. Is there a county wide SRO training organization? So the SROs from selling in Fair Oaks and Drainsville cross holiday or is it just straight yes up so um our sro program um so each district station has a certain amount of schools uh you know i think west Springfield district has the most schools uh, of any of our districts um and so each you know middles every middle school every high school has an sro um those sros are required to go through an sro school every single year doesn't matter if they went to one the year prior because you know things change uh, within the state code, things change within our MOU with schools about, you know, how we should uh, handle certain situations. And so, um, so locally, you know, I have a set amount of SROs and, and, and yes, they do belong to the Sully district station, but we also have, um, three SRO sergeants. So we have, uh, basically divided the county into three sections. So we. You know, each sergeant is responsible for a certain uh, number of schools in a certain area. Uh, and then we have a police uh, a commander, a first lieutenant, who is the school liaison commander. So his office is in uh, the gatehouse with the school board. And so he is their direct liaison. Um, and so he not only is, is, like I said, he's a liaison, uh, but he oversees the SRO sergeants. And those SRO sergeants oversee the um, the SROs. So there's a there's a chain of command on both sides. So both on you know as far as you know more of a a, uh, a decentralized side, and then also on a centralized side through the station. A matrix organization. And I can also add that we also have um, training for SRO sergeants together. And how they can work and support one another. I can add that within the SRO, SRO school itself, my team puts on specific training about threat assessments, threat management, because the, those types of cases at the schools kind of run the spectrum. And some of the less serious incidents are tasked to the SROs. And I can tell you from experience, they do a phenomenal job mitigating 
uh, a lot of those um, threat cases that come up at the school, some of which obviously won't involve the bias crimes or bias incidents, but just the threat itself. And they do a really good job. They can get down. They can. They can figure things out pretty quickly. Okay. Well, and then I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank all the members of the forum. I hope that the people who attended were informed. Uh, if you have not signed in the sign-in sheet, uh, some people haven't. Please go ahead and do so. Okay. And then, folks who are participating from the audience, uh, I'm going to ask the folks in the back of the room first to identify themselves, and then we'll go this column forward. So please, starting in the back. I'm uh, Lewis Grimm. I'm the uh, first vice president for Farm District Council and representing the Franklin Farm Committee. Hi, good evening. My name is Bob Lake. I'm the deputy chief of police for operations on behalf of uh, Chief Kevin Davis. Same thing. You all for being here. Uh, here for our, our police commander and the deputy county executive who is something like that would be how to jump in. The relationship we have with Fairfax County Public Schools the second we communicate regularly. We don't have some of the issues that that you see uh, in different areas of the county in this cooking community. Uh, it's every day that we feel that they should be together, but collaborate in this team with us. We don't want to school system. At least for all of them, or else they don't want their own homes. The rest of the kids, that's not what we're there for. So I appreciate the engagement. I mean, this is what makes our community stronger, makes the student department stronger, and school stronger, and uh, I just want to say thank you all. Okay, and the people here in the, in the audience, starting on this over here. Thank you. Lifelong resident of Fairfax County. And uh, love the place. I love the fact that you guys were here. And I just have to be entering a campaign for a supervisor. So I'm trying to learn everything that I can here in celebration. So I appreciate the efforts here. Ma'am? City Hall, I'm one I, I think there was a lot of questions. I can hear it. I'm dying to the so we can hear it. Just Again, thank you for coming. We really appreciate your being here tonight. And it sounds like Fairfax County is doing something special, and we want to export it to other counties because we seem to have a good solution. And I'm glad that tonight we have no action items that we have to follow up on. Thank you again all for joining us. Thank you all for here. The Sully District Council will convene and follow up on its normal activities. So if you have some information and like to stay around for the Federation, uh, the Sully District Council's activities, please stay and listen to us. Thank you so much. We do appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I love you so much. Have a good night. Thank you for being here. Okay. So, and I thank you so much. Thank you for that. We thank you for coming out. Thank you so much. We really appreciate this. Okay. And if, okay, so now I'm going to share. The agenda for Okay, so uh, from here, uh, and here. Okay, so now I go back here and I share. Here. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, we have here, and you've all seen this is the agenda for tonight's meeting. We had on Monday the, and this was met on Monday the 20th, the 17th of April, so that takes off. But we talked about the tr truck ban on Toll Run Post Office Road, and we approved the resolution which supported the resolution going forward, and that it be done and monitored and get done within the nine month statutory de deadline. We also looked at the ZMAR number two, and as you know, the Supreme Court had validated the adopted ZMAR amendment, cleared the void. And so on April 11th, the County Board of Supervisors re advertised it, and they included in it the separately passed agri agricultural modification called agritourism. And we had objected to both the ZMOD, its consideration, and the agricultural And So we had a direct resolution, which was approved, and we're going to add a new item to object by data synthesis by right and a paragraph to agritourism. And we're strongly and unanimously opposed to that. As the parking we imagine, we had a the county originally issued a plan amendment, but that plan amendment was based on ZMOD. Since ZMOD was out of ruled out of order, it had agreed, it has not yet finalized it. But we're looking at the parking reimagined as originally one. And we had a draft of that. We discussed the Federation's pro con imagined parking reimagined table and a chat GP query. So it's going to be reformulated and presented at our May meeting. And don't forget that on the 13th of May, more information will follow. But we have a meet a tour of the preserve of Westfield just across the street. And we'll be able to see the apartments and how they came up with innovative apartment complexes. Uh, as a scheduled meeting event, the Fairfax Citizen of the Year Honors Banquet is on the 7th of May. John Litzberger is the Citizen of the Year 2021, and Marco Johnson is 2020. If you follow the link here, you get more information about that. Let's honor John Litzberger. He's a member of our joint committee. He's a resident of the Run, and the best one you can honor him is to be there. And next month, we have at 7 p.m. on the 24th, the report from Richard. We now have four delegates and senators who have responded positively. That's 40% out of uh, four out of 10 uh, elected uh, from our caucus from some representing Sully. Next year, the caucus will be vastly diminished because of the redistricting. And on the land use committee, which happens on the 15th of May, there is a data set to propose along. Sentable Road uh, on Route 50, west of the park, the auto park, south of Route 50. And then we'll be discussing parking reimagined. So those are the items that will be discussed on the 15th of May and the 24th of May. Uh, we'll send out this thing. There's another meeting that Lewis pointed out to me that I will include in the May minute, minute agenda, and I'll include that so that the people are interested in the time as well. Anybody have any other comments before we let you go for the night? Okay. So that's where we stand tonight. We will meet again first on the 13th of May. And we'll, we'll meet in the office there. That more information will be provided. And we'll have uh, the 15th of uh, Two days later, we'll have our land use transportation meeting. And the week and two days later, we'll have our Report from Richmond. And with that, thank you for attending. I hope this is working. Yeah. I would say, yeah. I would should be worried. Well, it sounds like it. Uh, I think we're very fortunate. We have a lot of heads in the front. Yeah. 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 What I did tonight was I always try to do is I put I had a little set of you know ear earbuds in my ear when I logged onto my computer it was up. I could hear uh Dr. Francis Ivy better through my headphones than I could see here. So that meant that I was one of those I'm like Sarah and this microphone is on the side. 
Thank you all for coming. For comments from resident four. <laughs> I was just going to say, did you invite each individual or did they kind of? No, no, I sent an invitation to the anti defamation league. I sent an invitation to the police chief, to the Commonwealth's attorney, to the county executive, to the chair of the board. They're having, the board's having an off site meeting and to this public schools. Okay. I asked them if they could not attend to send a representative. And the police chief asked these people to show the school boards. Michelle, uh, who is the degree, was going to be here. And as indicated, she had another function. And they were afraid that she would get it late. So they sent her deputy here. Um, an ADL sent me a person here. I did reach out to the NAACP. And I thought Carrie D. Moore was be in her personal experiences. I tried to reach out to the Latino community and to the Asian American community. I could not get anybody here. I was wondering about, I wanted to have their input as well from their perspective. Could not get anybody here. Which shows you again, maybe there was a problem. Well, I just thought it was good because it was nice to see you have safety and security from the county employee side, who we'll happened to be a firefighter before, which I covered. Was cool. And then a detective, you know, so you had the full yeah. realm. And, and for me, it's just a, just as a citizen, you know, it just it really feels good seeing the different people all together at the table talking about a subject that they're all working on, which leads me to feel pretty good, which I appreciate you guys here as the council put that on. This is the first time ever we've done something. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not just the solid, this is a county wide. Yeah. Like, and we have mm -hmm. Yeah, newspapers for too. That's, that's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, any other comments, questions? Uh, I think just kind of following on how I think we have tried to do some similar things, but in the kind of public safety in general. Mm -hmm. But we try to find everything in the other kind of presenters from Fairfax County Police, from the Fairfax County Sheriff's Office, mm -hmm. and from the Virginia State Police. Yeah, that's part of it. they all have different. Role responsibilities right. areas of perspective. Yeah. So every other year we invite either the fire department or the police the police four people in the sheriff's department, we invite Sully Station and Fair Oak Station because they both cover Sully. Mm -hmm. We invite the Sheriff's Department and Sully Ray. And then we invite the uh, state police. And usually the state police tell us things. Okay. <laughs> but then we usually get them to show, and then the last time I was either that or the second time before, the guy, the state police guy, said he and his wife were very trepidation to the job in the world of the state section because he's from South Spain. He says, he was pleasant, he said, he's living here. I thought that was a perspective from a, a state policeman. Yeah. We're from South. How are we going to go? That was such a funny thing to hear. So, in June, we have Captain Smith for the report to the state of Sully. Uh, as I said, next month, we have the report from Richmond. And then I'm working with the League of Women Voters for the state uh, uh, assembly. And the senator election, the Sully, and the next month to have the county offices, school board, county uh, supervisors, the clerk of the court, the clerk of the court, Commonwealth attorney, and possibly uh, solar board. Those are you know, those are all. Catch, yeah. catch, catch, catch. Yep. I think there are fourteen people running the Sully. 14 positions that we can work on for one election. The most people in any one election, and the election has the lowest turn out of it. Yeah. Yeah. With that in mind, see you in May. Have a great time. Remember, let's honor John Lee's. You're going to get the biggest What's that? You will get the biggest Go to uh, fcfc.org, follow the link, and it'll bring you to the yeah, but up here it says uh, for more information, click here. Oh, that's not okay. Click there, and it'll bring you to the place. And like everything else, it's got my crappy CGI experience. Just like that membership form that we.
you submit. I use that and said, all right, let me see if I can come up with an RSV people. So it's taken. You can pay by PayPal, and there's a link that will bring you there, or you can send a check, which I remember the post office is an American check out. What's the website you can put there? So this is the Fairfax, this is Tully, Michigan. So if you go directly to here, let me show you this one right here. If you go to this is right Okay, and so here is the Sully District Org website, which I maintain. So there you go. And so click on dot org and go down here and you'll come up to the next Sully District Council meeting agenda. Okay, click on the agenda, and here's the agenda. And then down here, when you go to schedule meetings and events, click here, come here, and now you get to the the Fairfax City Senior Purpose Award, and you go down further to Lixenburg. I'll have more pictures here, and then please take here to register and pay for the banquet. And you have this form where you can identify all this information, you can indicate what your meal is, and then you can click here to submit by PayPal, or if you don't, you can send the check to the address in there. Okay, so again, all created by me. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Good to see fun. you guys. Very bored is the third Thursday in the Federation General. It's for the